jump into it here. Um, I, uh, I spend most of my time running our startup accelerator, uh, but I also am a partner in all of our various venture funds. Uh, and so with Josh Baer, he and I have made, we calculated more than 200 investments together over the last few years. So one of the benefits I have is just seeing lots of deals and, and making a lot of investments. I'll use the, these slides as, uh, oh, it's kind of a backdrop, but I might skip over a few. I want you to see that a, f a few are in here, but I'd rather get to the Q&A with Kelsey so we can talk about what's on your mind. Is that all right? Good. Um, so who's here? Anybody here for the first time at Capital Factory? First time? Three or four? Well, welcome. Hope you enjoyed the tour. Hear the story. Are any of you members here at Capital Factory? A couple? Welcome. Awesome. Uh, anybody moved to Texas in the last six months or so? Ah, great. Great. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Texas. I'm a native. I've lived in Austin for uh, 93 years, but lived in Texas all my life. Um, were any of your parents entrepreneurs? You've got it in your genes. That's cool. Um, well, raise your hand. Are you, are you a founder of a startup right now? Most of you, 80%, some not, maybe some thinking about it. Okay. Uh, how many of you are focused on uh, B2C or you've got a consumer focused uh, solution? Any, any B2Cers out there? Awesome. The rest are B2B, those of you that are founders. All right, it's a pretty good mix. Anybody looking for investors already? Yeah, aren't we all? <laughs> Even if you're not raising a round of funding, you should be looking for investors. That's what they say. You're always fundraising, or you should be. Um, all right, we're going to cover a variety of things, a little bit about Texas, a little bit about the Texas markets. I'm going to focus mostly on what it takes to raise a seed round of funding. I find that most of the attendees here are not uh, raising their Series A is their next round. They're raising something before that. They either don't yet have a product in the market or they do have a product in the market with some early customers, so you're raising something in the general range of a, of a seed round. Um, and the cool thing is you don't have to write all of this down. You don't have to take copious notes necessarily, and that's because these slides are available. The one link you want to you want to write down is the bit.ly slash Texas fundraising, bit.ly slash Texas fundraising. That's because I do skip over a good startup class, uh, Sam Altman with Y Combinator, a lot of good uh, interviews and videos there uh, that you could watch, they're free, and his startup playbook is out there, uh, playbook.samaltman.com. Uh, those are some resources that I want to highlight, many of which relate to fundraising. Uh, a couple other things that we do here at uh, Capital Factory. I run a quarterly boot camp called Founders Academy. It's, uh, it's a four-day lunch and learn, Monday through Thursday, 11.30 to 1.30 each day. I cover about 17 lectures out of my 50 lecture set. It's what I consider kind of the foundational set of content. Uh, we go through everything, including elevator pitches, sizing your market, customer acquisition uh, strategies, pricing and marketing basics, uh, business development secrets, some um, uh, dive into mergers and acquisitions and things that you should or shouldn't be doing now so that your company is acquirable in the future. And then the last day is five lectures exclusively on fundraising. Okay, It's free for Capital Factor members. It's only 49 bucks for the general public. And the URL is here, foundersacademy.eventbrite.com. If that sounds at all of interest, I do it once a quarter. And the next one is the middle of October. It's uh, October 14th or 15th, whichever, whichever day is a Monday of that week. Uh, that's the starting day and it runs for four days and that, that event bright is up and then uh, literally just today I uh, launched the pre-sale of a book that I've been writing for the last eight months uh, it's a fundraising book it's titled startup success and this first volume the subtitle is uh, funding the early stages of your venture it's about 215 pages of uh, hopefully valuable insights and, and aha moments um, the objective is to dramatically help you improve your fundraising success um, it's available for pre-sale now. It'll be up on Amazon uh, around the 23rd of this month or so. Anyway, if that's of interest, you can find more information about it and do a pre-sale at startupfundraisingsuccess.com. Startupfundraisingsuccess.com. It'll redirect you to a website where I've published about 150 articles, but I've got a page just on the book, and that startupfundraisingsuccess.com will take you straight to that page. Um, all right, and then there's a lot more things that we do uh, here at Capital Factor, almost every Tuesday, we have one of these AMAs going on. So, you know, this is the fundraising in Texas. Um, we have an intro to the Austin startup scene. So those of you that are uh, new to Austin, new to Austin, you want to get plugged in and find out more about the resources that are available. There's a lot that goes on here. That's a good one. 
uh, how to become a mentor or an investor. We do those AMAs a lot. We cycle those in. So if any of you are serial entrepreneurs and you're interested in mentoring or you know one that should be a mentor here, that could be a good one. Um, you might have learned that the Army moved to town uh, not that long ago and they set up shop uh, about three blocks away but also here at Capital Factory. They have one third of our eighth floor. It's our Center for Defense Innovation. And so with that, there is a lot going on for um, companies that want to sell into the military or into the government. There's a lot can be learned there. So we now host an AMA just on getting connected into uh, defense. We do road trips uh, just about every third Tuesday. We go to another city, another major city in Texas and we take uh, mentors and entrepreneurs and investors <coughs> there. And I've got, some, I've got a slide, I think, with a with a photo of that, but that's an activity that you guys can participate in if you're interested in meeting your like kind in another major Texas city. Uh, you wanna meet investors in those other cities. Really, really good activity. We do epic office hours while we're there, so you get to spend time with mentors. And then on the fourth Tuesday, we do founder stories. We showcase a founder that's been there, done that, had a success. They usually have also had something that was not a success that they're okay to talk about, so you get to kinda hear directly from them and ask them questions, it's really, really valuable. Okay? So let me tell you a little bit about our Texas Startup Manifesto, and then we're gonna dive into some fundraising. Um, those of you that have lived in Texas, this is not a surprise. Uh, those of you that are new to Texas, you might not know that we've got this thing called the Texas Triangle. The, the geography, if you, if you draw lines between Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin, you, you get this triangle. For those of you that happen to be in Austin, we're not exactly geographically in the middle of that triangle, but we're kind of the closest thing, and, and, and we can get from here to Houston on a day trip. Here to San Antonio, certainly on a day trip, even a half day might be possible. Here to Dallas on a, on a day trip. So from any of these cities to the others, you can make a, make a day trip out of it, and that's, that's pretty cool. Um, we decided that because Texas is doing so well that we wanted to em embrace this fact that there are these major metropolitan markets that are so close. And you know, part of this is because Texas as an economy is a really important and, and big economy, growing super fast, uh, one of the largest economies uh, in the country, um, one that would even be the 10th largest economy in the world. So if Texas were its own country, we'd be the, the 10th largest economy in the world, actually. Um, there's a lot of startup activity in Texas. This is the Kauffman Foundation. They put out various indices. This is from 2017, but it doesn't really change that much from year to year. Texas being the second most active uh, startup market in the country behind California. Um, and if you double click on that and you go into the major metropolitan area, so not at a state level, but a metro area, um, four of the most active startup markets in the country are in Texas, with Austin being at the top. Austin has had a longer tenure as a tech hub and as a startup hub, so that's the, the main thing that we have going for us here. We've been doing this for a while but with San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas not far, not far behind. This is on a, on a startup index. Um, also, great markets for hiring talent, especially technical talent, engineers, and whatnot. Uh, Dallas and Austin both ranking on this in terms of employers getting the best value for their money when they hire that talent, and employees having their dollar stretch further than uh, many other markets in the country. So it, it works well for both sides of that equation, which is pretty cool. Uh, and if you click in a little bit more, Austin is the 11th largest in the country, always on the fastest growing list. Uh, we've been a tech hub for many decades, a startup hub also for at least a couple decades. We've also become kind of a place where the big, big tech companies from the west and the east coast decide to, to set up shop with usually their second largest R&D center. You might know that Apple's second largest R&D center in the world is, is here in Austin. And you know the who's who of, of names now have uh, many hundreds, if not several thousands uh, of employees. It's a pretty diverse tech scene here, meaning we're not defined just by one thing. In the early days, it used to be semiconductor and early systems hardware. You know, we grew up as a, as a semiconductor city a long time ago. And then IBM decided to buy a company called Tivoli for about $800 million in the late 90s. And that kicked off our enterprise software boom. And now you fast forward 20 years later, and it's kind of a melting pot of kind of everything, which is, which is really nice. Dallas, bigger city. When you think Dallas, you think metropolitan. Uh, you think Fortune 500 headquarters. We don't have hardly any of them here uh, in Austin, uh, maybe a couple off and on. You know.
know, if Dell is, if Dell's a public company versus not a public company, that dramatically changes things for the number of public companies we have in Austin. But that's not the case in Dallas. There's 23 Fortune 500 headquarters there. A lot of family offices, a lot of family wealth in Dallas. So when we think of billionaires, um, well, me as a native Texan, when I think billionaires, I don't, I don't necessarily think Austin. I think Dallas and I think Houston. That's where the family wealth is and passed down generation after generation. Houston, some similar attributes, um, but when you think Houston, you've got to think about the energy sector, right? The energy capital of the world, or one of them for sure. Um, you would think about aerospace there. You would think about the Texas Medical Center as one of the world-renowned medical institutions. In fact, it's not one, it's something like 27 of them on, a, on the same campus, so a lot of healthcare research going on there. So that does influence the mix of tech companies that we see coming out of Houston. A lot more hard tech, a lot more deep tech. We see life sciences and biotech and physical products. Hardware companies are there, companies that have to have labs and things like that. 25 Fortune 500 companies. Uh, Dallas and Houston, of course, are the bigger markets for, uh, for sports, professional sports and college sports. So companies that are in sports tech, uh, they might be advantaged a little bit by being close to, to Houston or Dallas. And then San Antonio, a lot of people don't know, seventh largest in the country. Um, there's some military bases there that influence the fact that the Cybersecurity Command headquarters is there. So there's a big military presence in the in the San Antonio area. You know, former big uh, Air Force base there. Some big companies like uh, USAA and Rack Space. Uh, you know, a good market and very close to Austin, almost like a sister city. We're so close. My commute to San Antonio isn't that much further than when I lived out near Lake Travis and would have to get downtown, to be honest with you. Um, so those are a little bit about the markets, especially for those of you that have uh, only lived in Austin or maybe you moved to Texas recently, I want you to know what's going on because the idea here is to try and connect, connect this together. And uh, by bringing more of these things kind of Texas, it's, it's kind of happening organically and we're trying to take advantage of it and kind of create this single mega city so the question for Capital Factory about two and a half years ago now when Josh Baer wrote that Texas Startup Manifesto is could we be um, the catalyst to connect the four major metropolitan markets in such a way that it appears like it's just one startup ecosystem. It's connected, it's collaborative, resources from one could be utilized in the other. In other words, so all the startups don't have to just move to Austin just because, right? That's, that's what usually happened in the past is if you were a startup in in Houston or Dallas or, or whatnot, you would feel this pressure to move to Austin because it's where most of the tech talent was, it's where uh, almost all of the venture capital was, it's where most of the mentors that had, that had built and exited companies and then became, uh, became mentors were. But that's changing and we wanted to, we wanted to accelerate that change. Uh, we'd like startups that are homegrown and are best served in Houston or Dallas or San Antonio to be able to stay there. We'd like a startup in Austin that's selling into the energy uh, market to easily be able to move to Houston because that's where their customers are without feeling like they're giving up anything. So that's the big grand goal um, that, we're, that we're embarking on. And we're connecting the ecosystem players through uh, an operating system that's called Union. It's a platform that we use where our mentors are on there, uh, entrepreneurs are on there, connections can be made, networking can be facilitated. Those of you that have a work membership here at Capital Factory, you would know what union is. That's how you get access to the mentors, not just here, but virtual mentors uh, that are on the platform anywhere in the state, anywhere in the country, and, and even anywhere in the world. One of our accelerator startups told me that his most valuable mentoring session was with uh, uh, an advisor and investor in Dubai. And it, that was exactly who he needed. It was a great office hour session and he agreed uh, decided to invest at the end of the meeting and made an introduction to one of his buddies who invested in the company too. So it's pretty powerful. Um, you did the tour, or many of you, you either did the tour or you already know about our place, so you know we've got a lot of square footage in, in this building here, uh, four different floors. You might not know that we have 26,000 square feet in Dallas at a place called the Centrum, fairly centrally located. It's near Old Parkland. It's where the family wealth, the family office money is. Um, and let's see, we moved there uh, last summer, so it's been more than a year. We're going on a year and a half here pretty soon. 
Um, and in Houston, we operate out of a co-working space called the Canon. Uh, the main campus is in West Houston at I-10 in the Beltway. There's a, a remote site uh, near the gallery, a little closer in, and they're going to be opening up space in downtown Houston by the end of the year. And so uh, we've got a lot of portfolio startups that are in Houston as part of our accelerator. And so we've now got our presence in those three cities, and we're still partnering and exploring in San Antonio. So this journey continues. But this is one of those bus trips I was telling you about. We just load it up with entrepreneurs <coughs> and mentors and investors and, and go to a different city. Uh, about three weeks ago or so, we went to Fort Worth. And we took a bus from Austin, a bus from Houston, and a bus from Dallas. And we descended on Fort Worth and just freaking took over this place. Had about 200 people there and did a whole afternoon of programming. It was really, really good getting everybody connected. So join us on one of those. This is an old shot. I can tell this presentation is old because we now have a staff here uh, that I think is about 90, uh, 90 employees at Capital Factory between here and Dallas. Yes, sir. Do you always uh, congregate in Dallas or do you sometimes do those bus trips and come to Austin or to San Antonio? Thank you. It's a different city each time. Okay. And usually we're going, we're, we're usually we're taking Austinites somewhere else. We're taking them to Dallas and then the next month it'll be Houston, the next month it'll San Antonio, I mentioned Fort Worth as a, as a one-off, and then there are once or twice a year where we bring buses from those other cities to Austin because we have Austin Startup Week going on, for example. We might, uh, I don't know the exact plan, but we probably have a bus coming from Dallas and Houston to Austin for Austin Startup Week. So it's mostly us going somewhere else, but every once in a while it's bringing others here. Pop of logistics, right? Sorry? Yeah, mostly logistics. Just Around. Yeah, well, and part of this is we're just trying to we're just trying to mix it up. You know, we want the, the two different communities or multiple communities to get to know each other, and the investors love it because investors like investing with other investors. So they come out for a couple reasons: they get to meet the investors from those other the, the other city that's participating, and they also like deal flow. So they're looking to meet the startups that are in that other city. And uh, so that's kind of what makes it work. I mean, one of these days we might stop doing it, but we've been doing it for about a month and a half now. And we keep, as long as we keep filling the bus, we're going to keep doing it. Awesome. Yep. Um, so raising capital, should you raise capital? I always say that uh, companies only raise money for one of two reasons. They either want money or they need money. I know it sounds simple, right? The want versus need thing, but there's a dramatic difference um, in your experience if you're raising money out of want versus need. Most of you will raise money because you need the money. If you don't raise the money, the bank account goes to zero and you have to pack up your toys and go home and do something else. Um, if you can raise money out of want, you have a lot of optionality, right? Because it means like, hey, if, if it's there, that's great. I, it means you'd like to accomplish things faster. That's why you would raise the money, the want versus need. And um, from who might you raise the money? Well, it kind of, it depends. Uh, this, this axis here, the vertical axis is, is the scalability of the business you're working on, and the horizontal axis is how capital intensive it is. This is just a very, very broad rule of thumb. But if you have a business that's not very scalable and not very cash intensive, well, then you could just bootstrap that venture and probably get to a cash flow positive or profitable um, company and it might not get to $100 million in revenue, but hey, what if it pays you a couple hundred, few hundred grand a year and you get to hire 15 or 20 employees and have a whole bunch of happy customers? Like, I'd call that a success. Um, if you have a scalable venture that's going to require a lot of capital, you're reasonably quickly going to find yourself uh, knocking on Kelsey's door to, to hit, hit up uh, her venture fund for some money. That's, that's why we have the venture capitalists. They like to invest in scalable businesses that can get really big and, and get acquired for a lot of money or go public for a lot of money. And then the, you know, if, if you're in that bottom right uh, quadrant, you're in big trouble. You, it's not scalable, but it's capital intensive. Like, ah, those don't go very well together. And so, you know, it's in that, in that middle that, you know, a lot of us will dance. We'll start climbing up the scalable curve. We'll raise money from angel investors, and then we'll get attractive to, to VC. So there's a million different paths. There's no one path you have to take, but this is maybe one way to think about it. Does that make sense, conceptually? Uh, Mark Suster put this tweet out that, that many of us quote we really like, but uh, investors invest in lines, not dots. So uh, a lot of us, we think this is like a 
comp it's like a sales process where we have a meeting, we have a discussion, we lay out our case, and you know we get a decision at the end, a yes or a no. Um, and you might find some investors that do that. Uh, most of them that do, it's going to be a no. You know, if they make a if they make a decision in the first meeting, more often than not, I'll bet you ten bucks it's a it's a no, not a yes. And that's because I'll make I'll make money out of nineteen out of you for every twentieth one that I lose the money. Um, when you do get an investment from investor, this is especially the case with institutional investors like VCs and family offices, more sophisticated investors. Less so, but still true with angel investors. Um, you know, they want to watch your, they want to monitor your progress over time. That's what the invest in lines mean. They they want to see the shape of that curve. They want to hear you make a promise or a prediction of what's going to happen in the coming month or months, and then watch and see if in fact that happens or not. You know, they know how difficult it is to predict the future. So for you, just accomplishing most of what you predicted and promised is pretty damn impressive. So they want to they want to watch you a little bit over time. Unfortunately, time is not uh, it's not something that you have, right? Time is our most valuable resource as a startup. You know, you might think it's funding, but funding actually affords you time. Because with enough time, you can adjust and adapt and figure things out until you have a viable business, right? So we raise. We raise money to afford us time to figure things out. And then we raise money again to you know, grow the business. So think about this invest in lines, not dots. It's maybe something Kelsey and I can riff on a little bit on relate, building that relationship and, and cultivating that over time. Make sense? Um, so raising a seed round. This is a list. I think Josh published this somewhere. Uh, it's on, on Medium. What does it take to raise a half a million dollar seed round? Or what does it take to raise a million dollar seed round? And his kind of key ingredients, the case that he laid out, had to do with you know a team, a market, some traction, some social proof, and a product. You know, and you know at a high level that seems kind of kind of simple, um, but you know there are a certain set of ingredients, and before you have these things, it is really hard to raise money. You know, it's going to really drive you crazy when the investor says, well, you know, I'd like to see you get a, some paying customers. Like, well, yeah, duh. Like, I need your freaking money to build the product so I can get to the paying customers. You know, you know well, I'd like to see you have, you know, a couple co-founders. Well, duh. You know, if I had some money so I could attract somebody, you want me to go get co-founders and I can't pay them anything, right? So a lot of these things are frustrating. And what, what we're saying here is, you know, this is what you need to raise you know, half a million to a million dollar seed round. Many of you will need to raise money before you're ready, before you're at that stage. You'll raise, you'll raise some round of funding that we might describe as a pre-seed round of funding. Not a seed round, but the pre and the pre-seed implies that it comes before, which probably means it's before you have a shipping product and paying customers. And pre-seed rounds are just unbelievably, excruciatingly difficult uh, to close. They're smaller amounts of money, but that doesn't mean they're easier, right? Um, it's why the most dominant investor for a pre-seed round of funding is your rich aunt, rich aunt Sally and Uncle Fred, right? And they're investing not because they're, they're, they're super jazzed about your business or because they even understand what, what you're working on. It's because they love you very much and they've accumulated a lot of wealth and they'd like to give you $50,000 to advance your venture, right? Getting beyond Aunt Sally and Uncle Fred and getting an angel investor to open up their checkbook is a hell of a lot more difficult. Why? When you don't have customers and you don't have products, you still have an unbelievably high risk profile. Just getting to the shipping product with the paying customer, you still have a risky venture, but it's dramatically less risky than before having a, a real product with paying customers. Okay? And since, Angel, and since angels see so many opportunities to invest into companies that do have a product and a customer, and even though the valuation might be here, and you're offering a valuation of here, you know, your valuation you're proposing might be, I don't know, I'll just make it up, 50% less, but you're five times more risky. And so they're trying to manage this risk reward. So one, one concept I'll give you here in this part of it is raising money from angels in a pre-seed round before you have shipping product and paying customers requires what I refer to as hyper-intersected angels. I wrote an article. Uh, my articles that I've written are on, on a blog called Shockwave Innovations, and so the one I'm describing here 
is is has the something about the words precede and uh, precede and hyper intersected. I can't remember. Um, but a hyper intersected angel isn't a general purpose angel. Um, if you're working on a mobile app for a consumer mobile app uh, in the healthcare for for healthcare, I'm not hyper intersected with you. My 29 year career in tech had nothing to do with mobile apps, nothing to do with consumer, and nothing to do with healthcare. So I, I have no intersections with you other than I'm a human being and you're a human being, and that's not good enough. Okay, so you need to go find someone that built a career, made their money with mobile apps to consumers or consumer healthcare or tech healthcare or so break down the various uh, elements of your business model as much as you can and go find angels that happen to match two or three or five of those criteria. Why? Because they know the questions to ask you. The reason I shy away from it is I don't know what questions to ask. I don't know, I can't look at your resume and tell me if it's impressive. I can't look at your, uh, your strategy for acquiring customers to see if it makes sense for me because I, I didn't do that before. But if you get someone that's hyper intersected, they'll be able to decode all of that and it changes that risk profile. They'll be able to assess, are you 10 times riskier or just two times riskier? So they're getting half the valuation, but you're only twice as risky. See what I mean? Yeah, so think about that. Uh, you with me so far? Maybe two more concepts before uh, before I ask Kelsey to join me up here. Um, you're gonna have to figure out how much money to raise. And the way I like to describe it is the amount of money you raise. I've got this in an article in an article titled "How Much to Raise" or "How Much Should You Raise." The amount of money you raise affords you a combination of time plus resources, right? If I raise money, I can use it to gain a bunch more time or runway, or I can use it to go hire a bunch of people and spend money on marketing. That, that would be resources. In reality, it's some combination of those two, right? If I spent all the money on resources, then boop, I, run out of, I run out of time and I have to raise money immediately again. If I use it all for time and no more resources, well, that's fine, I have a lot of runway, I just can't move faster than I was. So, and these are in competition with each other. As, as I dial up more time, I have to dial down the resources. So they're in competition with each other. But if I raise money, do you agree that I get a combination of time and resources? And if I have time and resources, I can accomplish stuff. And I call those outcomes. This is really important right, ha right here. And the, the, the trap I see a lot of founders fall into is they pick the amount of money first. And they pick the amount of money based on, well, Gordon said half a million or a million was a seed round. And I talked to a lot of bunch of other founders that were raising a seed round. They said they were raising 500. So I just plugged in 500 into the spreadsheet. And Gordon said time and resources are in opposition with each other. So I just kind of, well, let's see. Uh, it sounds like a lot of people are getting nine months of runway or a year of runway off of that. So I'll put in a year. Okay, well, what resources could I afford to hire if my 500000 is going to last me a year? Okay, well, now I have that. Well, I wonder what I could accomplish with that. Well, yeah, we could do this, that, and the other thing. You're working the model the wrong way. The wrong way. And that's because you need to... When you raise money, you want this list of outcomes or accomplishments to be attractive to the next round of investors, right? You, this needs to have advanced the business to be interesting and attractive for whoever that next category of investors are. And because if you're not, then you get to do this whole thing all over again and you might not be rewarded with the step up in valuation. So what I recommend is that you look into the crystal ball and you write out the three or four or five outcomes reach reach eighty thousand dollars in monthly recurring revenue enter five new markets you know whatever these out, outcomes not activities like what are you going to accomplish and this is the story you would pitch a future investor and now that you know those outcomes now so we're going to work backwards we're going to go one and then two 
well, what combination of time and resources might be reasonable to achieve those outcomes? Okay, now you've dialed in some time and resources. Now your spreadsheet tells you how much money you need to raise. The other reason I recommend you do it this way is when you tell the investor you're raising $650,000 for your seed round of funding and they say, why is that the right amount of money? You say, well, it allows me to go get $65,000 in monthly recurring revenue, enter the next six markets, you know, get this partnership with so-and-so and whatever else. Like, ooh, that sounds like, that's interesting. I want to invest, I want to invest in a company that's going to do that in the future because that company can go raise money again. Make sense? Questions on that? Um, yeah. It kind of depends on the investor, right? And what they're keen on, if they are cool with dilution and that next round and all that. Um, and I just wonder, in your experience in this ecosystem with Capital Factory versus like angel networks, generally are the investors that are, you know, taking trips to Austin and Houston, et cetera, they're more kind of in tune with that model. Sure. Would you say? Yes, for sure. Okay. Meaning investors understand when they invest in a pre-seed or a seed round, they are going to assume that you're not just going to have one, maybe two or three more rounds of investment. Yeah, so they will know that they'll know that they will get diluted. They can choose to invest in those future rounds if they want to. Okay. Yeah. But you know, yeah, remember they get extra equity dollar for dollar at your early stage because of your lower valuation. And so I can afford for it to get diluted down because I'll have a smaller stake but in a company that's worth, you know, I'll have half as much, but a company that's worth 10 times as much. I like half as much in a company worth 10 times as much. Yeah, so yeah, that usually works out. Investors that understand this game will understand that from off of this, you will then do this to justify and step up in valuation. Raise, like if you're raising 500,000, do you include that in the financial projections or is it, if I raise nothing, this is what we project how it would go? Well, in your financial projections, let's let's save that for Kelsey. When, when Kelsey comes up, let's let's come back to that question. Financial projections, because there's 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 a different there's probably a different makeup and 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 projected length of your financials depending on what phase you're in. And and I'll you know I'll be happy to wear an angel hat and I'll ask Kelsey to wear her VC hat and let's talk about financial projections. So let me show you one more concept and then let's get to the questions. When you are when you're really raising money, I'm not talking about hitting up Aunt Sally and Uncle Fred, but you know, it's if you're raising a million dollars or subsequent rounds after that. Two things happen. Somebody in the company has to put on the chief fundraiser hat, okay? And that chief fundraiser is going to spend 80% of their time fundraising. That means they get 20% of their time to work on the business. So if it's only two co-founders or two co-founders and a couple contractors, that can have a real impact, right? You're not just sitting around twiddling your thumbs. So if, if, if when you're running the, running the campaign, run the campaign, if that consumes 80% of, of the fundraiser's time, you want this phase of everything to be as short as possible. If this takes five months, you're dead, right? During this phase. Too many founders jump straight into this phase. They skip two parts that I cover in my book that I think are really important. Start by spending 10% of your time uh, relationship building. Well before you need money, you're getting to know investors. I don't care if it's angels or institutional investors, you're taking meetings and you can spare 10% of your time and you just you actually even say the words, I'm not raising a round of funding right now, but I wanted to get to know you to see if this might be of interest to you, you know, when we do open up a round. As an angel or as a, as a VC, ah, we breathe a sigh of relief because you're not going to ask us for a check at the end of the meeting, right? You just want to you just want to see if if this is of interest to both parties. This lets you start to kind of narrow the field a little bit. Those that were yeah maybe yeah I could be interested. 
versus those that are super interested versus Gordon said, no, 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 I don't do mobile apps for consumers in healthcare because even, even when you do have a shipping product, that's not of interest to me. Okay, fine, I'll put you over in this other list. Then you, then you can spend 30% of your time in the second phase doing a test drive because off of this list, eh, you're not going to get into fundraising terms, but they might be curious, like, well, how much are you thinking about raising? Like, ah, eh, I don't know. It's going to be in the range of half a million, maybe a million. Let's see what they say. Oh, have you thought about valuation? No, nah, we haven't set the valuation, but I don't know. It's going to be in the range of three million. We're probably going to use a convertible note, right? So you, you might get a little bit in this relationship building, but just enough that when you go out on a test drive, you're going back to the ones that were, were seemingly more interested and maybe some new ones that might be good candidates. And now you have a more narrow range. Yep, Gordon, looks like we're gonna raise somewhere between six hundred dollars and $700,000 on a convertible note. We're looking at a valuation cap of such and such, maybe a little higher. What do you think? You know, And then based on this, you're gonna get even narrower as to what you think is gonna be successful. So then you carry, you carry that knowledge into hitting the start button and you're not fumbling around. When you, when, you do relate, when you try to do relationship building, test driving while you're running the campaign, you're just you're chasing your tail. And you look silly to investors because you're presenting yourself as raising money and then you come back and say, oh, well, we changed our mind. It's, it's not going to be a million and a half. We're only raising 750000 Ooh, that doesn't sound... If you needed 1.5, 1, 1. now you're saying seven fifty. Ah, it's probably because you realize there's not that much interest in the market. And, you, and, you know, and then you change the terms. It just looks it looks silly, and you discredit yourself, and you waste a lot of a lot of time at eighty percent dialed up. Does that make sense? So those are two things that I, I like to I like to cover is just some foundational concepts. What is the uh, average time for the first two steps? Average is going to be really. Yeah, I would just like to give an idea. Did you say the what, first two what, steps? Yeah, what's too long? Like what's no. I think it a bit the other way around. I think I, I work my way backwards. When do I when do I really need the money? So if I'm looking at the hourglass, you know, the, the sand is falling through. When do I really need the money? You know, it's somewhere out here. And well, let's put it out here because I, I want to safely close the round before I go to zero. Because yeah. if you close the round when you got one week of cash left, guess who has all the negotiating power, right? So okay, it's out there, so I'd like the round to close by here. Okay, I'm going to be running the campaign for two or three months, maybe. It depends on the size of the round. Okay, so now I know when I need to start the campaign. And then the truth is, 100% of the time when I'm not running a campaign, I'm in relationship building mode. So I'm just, I'm always doing this. Sure. Always. So then it's just a matter of, you know, I'm always doing this, so when I see when I need to raise that, I'd like to have, you know, the test drive, and that might take you two weeks. Like, if you if you have a list of investors, hey, can I have a quick update with you? And, you know, and, and this might only take you a couple weeks for the test drive. Yeah. So, you, you, yeah, you just work your way backwards. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. All right, Kelsey, you want to come join me? Yeah. All right. Let me find, I'm going to fast forward real quick. I want you to see these slides um, in the deck. If you go to the one on, online, there's a list of some accelerators, angel networks. There's a there's a lot more than that in, in Texas, but this is kind of a catalog. Seed investors, more seed investors, A investors, some corporate VC. There's some more than that. Some newer funds, uh, VCs that travel here and have investments here. Okay, so that was I just wanted you to see that that list was was in there so you can refer to it. Um, okay, so Kelsey is on the investment team over at Silverton Partners. If you don't know them, they, I'm pretty sure, the most active, most active Series A investor in Austin. You guys claim most to be? Most active VC firm in Austin, in Austin, according to CV Insights. There you go. Yeah, we do see it in Series A. Um, it would be helpful to have Yep, background. for those of you that don't know Silverton, um, let's have Kelsey tell you all a little bit so you understand kind of where they fit in their investment thesis. Yeah. Hi, it's great to meet you all. Uh, my name is Kelsey. I work at uh, Silverton Partners, and as Gordon mentioned, we're the most active early stage VC firm here in Texas. Been around for about 15 years now, and we're investing out of our fifth fund. It's about a $108 million fund, and um, we're typically focused on leading seed and Series A rounds. 
we're generalists, so we look at pretty much everything. Um, the portfolio is a mix of uh, basically you know, the Texas ecosystem at a given point in time. So 15 years ago, and that looked like, um, like semiconductors and kind of enterprise infrastructure. Uh, we were investors in Silicon Labs, which some of you who've been in Austin um, may be familiar with. Uh, fast forward you know, 15 years to 2019, and uh, it looks like much more of a spread of uh, B2B software, B2C software, uh, tech-enabled services, and some direct-to-consumer, I mean, like digitally native brands more recently. Um, our typical initial check size will range between 500K to 4 million, and we can do more or less than that, uh, depending. Uh, as I mentioned, we're lead investors, so we'll be really hands-on. Um, for the rounds that we lead, we'll take a board seat. And uh, the last thing I think I'll mention is um, geography. So we're Texas focused and we're known for being Texas investors, uh, but we do invest opportunistically outside of Texas as well. So we have a handful of companies located in um, kind of the East Coast, New York area, a couple in Utah, one of the partners, we spend time operating companies out there, and we have one in uh, Los Angeles as well, but we're geographically agnostic, so we can really invest anywhere. But yeah, that's a little bit about us in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you. And I don't know if this is a true fact, but I can predict that Capital Factory probably has co-invested with Silverton more than any other VC. I mean, we just we go back for a long time, so we co-invest with uh, you know all the VCs in Texas. But I bet you we have more co-investments with yeah. Silverton than others. And this is the last new deal we did together with Fetch. Could be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. What questions do you have about Silverton? Any questions about the fund for Kelsey before we get into general questions? Yep. Well, you just mentioned taking a board seat for anybody you invest with. So that means that you only invest in C Corps generally, or do you do LLCs? Yeah, so at the point that we would make an investment and lead like the preferred like equity round, uh, the company would be structured as a C Corp. Um, and also, just to clarify, we only will take a board seat if we lead a round. And the thing about the C Corp, just in case um, some of you are structured as LLCs, which is fine, 99 out of 100, maybe 999 out of 1,000 times, you would need to be a C Corp before a traditional venture fund would invest in the company. You might find some family offices. Family office basically is the investment arm of a billionaire. Uh, they might not have a problem with an LLC, but almost all venture funds have problems with the pass-through nature of your profits and losses if you're an LLC, and they, they have in their legal agreement with their investors that that won't happen. So just know that. Um, it just means you'll need to convert to a C-Corp at some point between, don't go do it right now, but just know that there's a C-Corp conversion in your future. Okay, can I ask a related question there? Is, is it with their investors, like the, the there is some kind of thing with pass-through? That That's right. Would do there? Can you explain <coughs> what's the concern? Yep. Like the, the C Corp. Yep. There yep. I got it. With the Here's the concern. So, um, so uh, yeah. So I'm a general partner in, in the Capital Factory Venture Fund, and we do have a lot of limited partners. And the the relationship we have with them is of also of a pass through nature. Uh, we pass through our profits and losses to them. But um, if we pass through a profit, it happened because we had some big exits. Big exits means I have cash in the bank. So pass through profit is almost certainly going to come with cash distributions to the limited partners. So they know that pass-through losses, they love having that on their tax return. Pass-through profits, losses they love, pass-through profits, they can predict that we will have cash in the bank. That's what caused those profits, uh, and we'll do cash distributions. That's not the case um, with you. If I invest in your LLC, you might pass through a big profit to me, but you chose to spend all that profit on employees, so I got a profit from you. I didn't get cash from you. Yeah. I know it was a long answer, but that's no, that's I, why. That yeah. Another question for Kelsey yeah. about the fund. Yeah, Kelsey, and the, you mentioned that you're, you, you are a round A investor, so you have a set criteria for companies before you move into the round A. Is there like a milestone, the outcome? Is there a, is there a, a sweet spot? Yeah. So we are actually um, seed and Series A focused investors, just like early stage in general. There's no one specific like, like revenue milestone or something like that that we're like actively looking for. Um, and the, so we're investing out of our the fund, as I mentioned earlier. And if you look at the companies that we've made new investments in in this current fund, uh, there are companies ranging from pre-revenue all the way to like maybe doing more than a million in ARR. 
Um, and it really just like depends on the type of business model and the type of product and all that, but there's like no really you're, like you're threshold. You're not A round, you're pre A. No, we're C, C and, and Series A. C Both. and A, okay. Yes. But let me ask, let me follow up and see if uh, this might be helpful for, uh, for a, a, a typical Series A investment. If I said, uh, if I said it was a Silverton led Series A yeah. and the round size was five million yeah. and I don't tell you anything else about the company, yeah. what might you imagine? Might you imagine a certain revenue level or, yeah. or uh, maybe maturity of the team? Is, it, it's, a, it's a scary one because like, you know, we don't want you to say, oh, you get to this revenue but there are some broad rules of thumb. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of that. Software, let's say it's a software company. Okay, is it a B2B SaaS software yeah, company? Yeah, like okay. yeah, enterprise, enterprise yeah. software. So if it's like an enterprise software, like B2B SaaS company, um, and, and they just raised a $5 million round. So first of all, from the Silverton perspective, uh, we'll write up to a $5 million check for our initial check. And then we'll reserve like 2X that amount for follow on. But the point is like, we could be taking that whole round or yeah. we could be like, if we're leading it, like. Maybe it's like three of the five. Three or three or, yeah. Yeah, we're leading it like it's it's like three of the five or whatever. Okay. Um, and so that business, if it's a B2B SaaS business, like a cookie cutter, like traditional company, with me knowing like nothing else yeah. about. Yeah, this is like a. Because it's like, it's, it's a, like, this is a board It's almost game, not even right? like worth like thinking about I have, it I have way, the card and you. it's so nuanced. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they could be doing upwards of like one to two. One to two million. ARR. Yeah. It could be even, it could be 500K ARR. If it's like 500K or 400 or whatever that number is, mm -hmm. like then we're seeing some like high velocity, like like we're seeing some like really strong like growth indicators on that business. Mm -hmm. So it's less about like the numbers, mm -hmm. I think, because every company really is different. Like you selling into, um, and like so the sales model matters too, right? Because we're investing in like the future potential of the company. Um, if, if like, I don't know, we see like a really large market size or the number of customers you have in a certain number of markets like looks a certain way and like you are hitting like those sales goals consistently like you might be raising the four million dollar round versus the five and the valuation might be different and like yeah. it really just depends it's almost like not worth it to this is really numbers. important to understand yeah. because um yeah it was it was it was almost a, a trick question but you saw how it played out and you saw how difficult it was i was trying to pin her down but she's not going to let me do that which is the right thing to do meaning not let me do that um, and that's because if you imagine like there's there's ten knobs and, and they're each going to get dialed in and they each represent a different aspect of the company of the business. Um, okay, you might have two million in revenue. Okay, well that sounds pretty good. I mean, Kelsey said maybe one to two million, so two million. Hey, go knock on her door, right? Well, maybe the growth rate is really crappy yeah. and maybe the team is not so impressive and maybe your market size is only. $250 million in market size, right? So these are the other dials. The dials all work in conjunction with each other. And if you get a bunch of them dialed up, oh, that's awesome. And it is possible that uh, that the one dial that's kind of down could be offset by other dials that were that are way up. She mentioned half a million in revenue. Okay, that didn't sound as exciting as yeah. one to two million, but maybe it's a marquee team of people that have all had two or three exits and they're in an unbelievable market, right? So this is the thing you're trying to do is you're trying to self-evaluate and then you're trying to kind of get this feedback from other investors. One of the benefits of just meeting with a lot of investors is they're going to poke on you and you should you should therefore be able to conclude like this dial is not as high as I thought it was and this one not so but they seem really interested in this. Okay, great. How can you turn some of these other dials up to kind of get more in that sweet spot? Yeah. You know? And just to kind of add on to that um, you know, like seeing that number, like a revenue number independently, you might get like an investor's interest right right away, right? Um, because like a lot of times they're meeting like super early companies, we're meeting super early companies. Um, and so seeing like that revenue number might peak like interest, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it gets you a meeting, maybe it gets you a call, whatever it is. But like that is as close, that's as much as like that will matter mm -hmm. before we start considering all of the other factors like Gordon just mentioned. Yeah. Um, and any one of those things on its own can, can yeah. Like make a deal a non-starter. But we, it is true that we kind of tend to lead with maybe the revenue metric, right? Because that's the that's the easiest one to put out there first, and it's the one that is the it's the least subjective. When I say I've got a badass team, if I put that in email, like, uh, what does that mean? But if I say I have 1.8 million in revenue growing at 80% a year, yeah. okay, at least that's a starting point. So I do believe that combination of revenue and growth rate might be one of the better ways to get the right. meeting. But it's not. That's not going to be sufficient to get the check. Yeah, agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? Yes, sir. 
Hi, I'm Kelsey. Uh, Hi. Thanks for being here. You said that you're in your fifth fund and it's about $108 million. Uh, I was just wondering uh, what year or how long are you into the fund? Yeah. Uh, so we are uh, about two years or so okay. into this fund, um, give or take a couple months. Right. We are basically, um, we'll, have, we'll do like a few more deals out of this fund and then we'll roll right into our next one. That question, yeah. Couple of them. So, one, what, what's the kind of typical term for a fund? How many years? Is it like part A and the question? Yeah, there's like the there's like the active investment life cycle for like new deals, and then there's like the total period like that will invest out of the fund with like reserves for existing yeah. corporation so companies. That's what I'm asking about the, the, the cycle. Yeah, it kind of varies. I mean, is it fair to throw out? Like, what number do you think is fair to throw out? Like, if, a typical, yeah. well, I don't know, I don't know if it's sober sense, but a typical, if, if most venture funds are 10-year funds, okay. uh, it, and they have options to extend, and many of them do extend to 12 years or 13 or 14. It means the investors want the fund to be wrapped up and disposed of in 10 to 14 years. Right, as in we want all the companies to be like, yeah. exited. Yeah, right. figure out a way to liquidate everything, and I like I want everything that I'm going to get within that period. And then the active investment period for new investments is usually two to four years. And then many funds will reserve, they'll hold back a certain amount to then follow on through the remain either the remainder of that 10 year period or probably not that far, but you know, because you don't want why would you put some put some follow on, you know, right before the fund ends. But those are the two yeah. dials. So so related question to that, is there is is when typically VCs go out and fundraise, is that seasonal as an industry or is it just completely varied by VC? Completely all variable. over the place. It's you know, yeah, it's yeah. It, there's no predicted. Mm -hmm, no predictable. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> and some funds that don't reserve uh, either at all or not very much, they might actually they they plan to make their new investments over four years, but actually came upon some really exciting ones, and in a little more than three years, they they made all their new investments, so they need to be raising the next one. Yeah, I haven't seen anything that was seasonal exactly, or or vintage years where there's a whole lot of new ones. Yeah, I think it's more random than that. Can we? Another question about the marquee team you mentioned. Um, so typically you look at founders or team members that have been exiting multiple times in previous ventures. Could you have a team that had a lot of experience in business running 10 to 100 million annual revenue that really know what they're doing to get the targets for that venture and still have the same appeal? Yeah, so when we say like a, like a marquee team, it could be a great team for a number of reasons. One might be that the CEO or the CTO or whoever it is they, they exited previous companies together, they were successful exits. Um, it also could be that the founders have domain expertise. Um, it could be that they've maybe worked together before in something that achieved some amount of success. Um, and there's a lot of other ways to look at an impressive team, like, like especially for the earlier funds. Um, like we'll evaluate like scrappiness and like ability to execute on goals and things like that, especially if it's like younger founders who maybe haven't had um, you know the time yet to achieve some of those things that an older team might have. Yeah. And just realize that, you know, this might be counterintuitive, but the personality, the process, the culture, and, and those ingredients for success in the very early days are so different than for companies that are 50 million, 100 million, and a billion, that if you told me that you had a four-person founding team all were senior vice presidents of, I'll pick IBM, I'm not picking on IBM, I started my career at IBM, but they're all IBM executives, all seasoned veterans, 25 years at IBM. I'm gonna say those are super smart people for sure and super successful. I don't actually know that they have the DNA to go from zero to 10 million. Uh, they actually will give themselves bad advice. Uh, I tell a lot of, a lot of career Fortune 500 executives that I'm not sure they're well suited to be a startup mentor and startup advisor. And they look at me almost offended and I'll say, hey, I'm just being honest with you. You're probably going to give them the exact opposite advice of what I'm going to give them. And I'm telling you that I'm right and you're wrong. You just don't know it because you've never lived in, in my movie, in my world. You're doing what's intuitive to you, but it's, it's sometimes opposite what we teach them in this zero to 10 million. Yeah, so it might be counterintuitive, but, and so a blended team, IBM executive and other industry executives, IBM exec has 
has connections and here's a scrappy entrepreneur that built a company and maybe didn't sell it for a billion but but exited for 20 million or 50 million they know what that movie's like you know mixing it up can be a good combo too yeah i also don't want to make it sound like you need to have started and sold companies or yeah. have done anything like yeah. like that in order to be a successful entrepreneur it's not true it is just like a method of like one kind of de-risking that some investors like will use but again it's like looking at that in conjunction with all of the other like factors that it takes to to start a company market product traction all of those things yeah. thank you good question in the back yeah if you're getting a little bit of brain or how do you feel about executive compensation how do i feel about yeah it? i mean so the co-founder say well i've worked i've been working for free for a year now i want to get paid i'm going to take your money and pay myself 150 grand a year how do you feel about that um i think it is going to depend on like the situation it's hard to just kind of throw out a blanket answer on that but if it's like an experienced executive and they've been working for free it makes sense once you've raised money you know to start compensating them numbers and like the exact amounts are very and gordon's actually um super great at putting together uh or helping founders put together a compensation plan so yeah maybe the two things i'll add is and now i'll put myself in an, in an institution now i'm now I'm, I'm capital factory venture fund not angel uh, I wouldn't like it if the tone that I was detecting from the founders is um, they, they built up debt and now it's time to pay that debt back. So they're going to overcompensate like, hey, I worked for free for five years. So yeah, I know 75000 would be the right amount, but I'm going to pay myself 150 because I went for free for five years. No, that's not the way it works. So, and it, it is this kind of gradual working your way up there. I would say most series a funded execs don't make what i would consider to be market rate for that level you know assuming they're a 10 million revenue company when you get to 10 million in revenue now i think most people are kind of at market rate market rate doesn't mean fortune 500 market rate but um but that path to to kind of 10 million in revenue it's just it's gradual steps that's one thing the second thing is it's very personal someone that just graduated uh, from college and they're living in an apartment with three roommates, their ability to you know, barely make ends meet but not stash away, you know, they're not topping up the, their, their IRA every year, that's one number that is a different number than someone that's middle age, uh, kids in, uh, you know, one in elementary, one in junior high, one in high school and has college on the way. So, you know, there's this very subjective evaluation of what's what's an okay amount of money to make and it, you might say it's unfair that the middle-aged middle-aged founder with certain situation is, is allowed to pay themselves five or six or seven thousand a month and uh, three years out of college the right number is two thousand a month but I think the investors are wanting to make sure that as much money as possible is going towards advancing the business and understanding that either of those founders that is so stressed out by making zero, their head's not gonna quite be right and they might make some screwed up decisions. So as investors, unfortunately, we're kinda, we're trying to evaluate, are they making a enough or too much, right? Yeah. When you evaluate how much, y'all you, you look at salaries, don't you? Or yeah, I mean, well, like, you know, founders will lay out how much they think Yep. It's fair to pay themselves. And but before and after, right? You see how yeah. much they're making now, and mm -hmm. after you, you're having we, a real, we look at both. you're yeah. having a discussion. Oh, yeah. Like before you'll invest, you, you need to know what yeah. they're, and do you you almost always see some pay raise before and after yeah. the A? I mean, does pretty much almost everybody always get some pay depends raise? Depends on the, yeah. um, depends on the company and the team, yeah. and how much revenue the business is already generating, yeah. um, and how much they want to put towards hiring other people, and if they can take care of themselves already, and yeah. you know, it really just varies. But. Delaware, baby. Yeah, is that it? Delaware. <laughs> if you're a Texas C-Corp and you want to raise money from Kelsey, don't change right now, but their term sheet is going to say, must be Delaware. Yeah, must be Delaware for sure. <laughs> but it's the case, you know, 99 times out of 100. Yeah, it's just there's enough case law. Delaware is the best place to be incorporated as a C-Corp. And so, yeah, you want to, and if you haven't done your, your, your C-Corp conversion, you know, and you want to get venture funded, just go ahead and con convert from your Texas LLC to a Delaware C. Yeah. 
so uh, you know, in B2B, you've got pipeline, right? And VCs call it deal flow. Uh, at least that's how I learned that. So in B2B, you've got a sales process. Uh, you know, as your prospects come through. I'm curious, both of y'all, do you have a defined sales process for tracking your deal flow, and are you willing to share what those steps are no. as they advance through the funnel? You have a pipe. You have a pipeline. You have a system, or is it? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> is it a spreadsheet? Is it something that's CRM-ish? Yeah, we, we use a combination of tools um, to, to track our, our deal flow. And there are, um, you know, you have to keep in mind, depending on like the size of the fund and the size of the actual team and how many folks they have that are doing like outbound versus just pure inbound. Because a lot of like the traditional venture funds, um, they're seeing most of their deal flow from like inbound, like from within each of the partners' networks. And so, um, when it, when you're like when most of your job is like that, you know, depending on the fund again, I think it makes like what you, how much you invest in tools and like um, you know tracking software and things like that like a little bit different than if you're like a maybe a bigger fund that's investing in a higher volume of companies. Um, you'll probably have like some more robust infrastructure to that. You know some of your counterparts. I'm assuming at the other Austin funds, yeah. most of the Austin venture funds are in the 50 to 125 million range or so. Would you think that most of them or not most of them have a CRM system? I would say that most of them have a CRM system. How sophisticated uh, that CRM mm -hmm. system is definitely. Might it be more than a spreadsheet? Overrated. More than a spreadsheet. More than a spreadsheet. But, yeah. um, and there have been tons of like startups that have even popped up trying to solve yeah. this problem for VC firms. Yeah. Um, and I'm even like constantly trying to keep up with, well, we all are within the firm, like trying to keep up with um, the latest and greatest tools that, are, that will help us do our jobs. Yeah. Um, better and more effectively and it is not a problem I think that's been solved um, really well so I also think the phenomenon on um, kind of sales process and managing deal flow leans a little more toward not a little leans more towards those that are lead investors if you're a lead investor you manage your deal flow a certain way as opposed to non lead funds the non lead funds yeah they want to have relationships but then actually the trigger is one of these startups that they've been managing a relationship with rings the bell and says, I got a term sheet, you know, we've been talking, hey Kelsey, do you wanna do you all wanna follow? So that would have some different attributes. If you're a follower, it's more it's it's the relationship part of relationship management as opposed to kind of the sale process, if you will. In the Capital Factory sense, um, I think we're pretty unique. We don't we don't have a sophisticated system for sure. Part of this is because a lot of our deal flow comes directly from our accelerator. So they raise their hand. We actually get a right to invest in there. If they raise a Series A, we have a right to invest a small amount of money. So you know we have a process that is well oiled for for handling those notifications because when it happens, we have 10 days to make a decision. So we're optimized. We're optimized for quick decisions, not managing a large pipeline in the sales sense. Has Silverton done any uh, smart city plays, or do you stay away from the government space? Yeah, good question. So let me just think about the portfolio really quickly and make sure I'm not missing. Smart city in the sense of like, what do you have in mind? Water data analytics and conservation water planning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's nothing in the portfolio that currently maps to that. Um, okay. Specifically, we're open to it. Um, if someone, if a founder is in this 10% relationship building, what tips would you give or what are the most effective ways to reach out to a silver and partner or to start building that relationship? Is it social media? Is getting a soft, uh, a warm um, connection or cold email or what, what do you say is the best? So both those uh, last two things you just mentioned are definitely ways you can engage, especially with like Twitter, right? I see so many, like there are so many founders um, and, and VCs, you know, on both sides who engage with one another on that specific platform. Why? I don't know. I guess because Twitter was a VC backed mm. startup at one point. There's probably just a lot of VCs that joined like 10 years ago, whatever it was. Um, I will say mm. that there's a number of ways to do that. So when you're in the relationship building phase and like Gordon, you know, uh, chime in, but um, I think you want to optimize for breadth because you're not necessarily completely hitting the ground like running with your fundraising process so the higher like volume of you know VCs you can potentially get your business in front of and get feedback from the better and like I think you kind of touched on that 
It'll help you narrow down your pipeline when you actually are pursuing the fundraise process. Um, and then another portion of your question was asking how to build those relationships, I think. Or like how do you get the first yeah. the first meeting? Send an email yeah. to say, you know, I would like to. If she sends you an unsolicited email, um, just one of the odds that, uh, let, let's say it, it looks interesting, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. But an unsolicited email and compare that to she gets to know me and, 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 and I send you an email. What's, what's the difference between her unsolicited email and my email to you? Yeah, so if you came in, basically that, that was essentially saying the difference between a warm introduction yeah. and a cold outreach, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's going to depend almost always. I mean, 10 times out of 10, if Gordon refers a founder to me, I will, we will take a meeting. The firm will look at the deal and we will develop a perspective around <coughs> it and like engage, right? Um, it's a lot less likely that that happens at any firm if you like come through, you know, and it's cold and it's not completely obvious like if there's a fit. So what you say in that email will really will really matter. Um, if it's clear to me, you know, in that email, for example, that you're a Texas-based founder, you're building a business that, you know, it fits one of the prior criteria I've mentioned. You know, it's early stage. You're about to raise a seed. You're about to raise a Series A. Um, you're in a space that is either interesting to like me or to if it's one of the other partners, like a space that they've maybe looked at before. Because as for you as a founder, like how do you know? Um, I think that's the easiest way to kind of deduce that information. Um, like, yeah, like the odds are, you know, I'm reading my email, I'm gonna look for one of the GPs at a, at a firm, it's harder to say. Um, but, you know, we do look at all of our emails and like something more often than not, it gets routed to me, so. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess if you can get a warm intro, get a warm intro. I know that's not always possible. And that's like a conversation around like accessibility and like inclusion and all of that. So um, we, I, put out my contact info like everywhere, you know. Um, founders are constantly like meeting us at events. Um, so we're making our, putting ourselves out there through things like this. Um, we meet a lot of founders through like other accelerator programs, incubators and things like that. There is social media and there is cold outreach. Um, so those are all potential ways. And like you can rank those, weight those against what's gonna be the most effective. But I think like bottom line is like have like a clear like way of presenting that information when you do send that email or ask for an introduction or whatever it is and make sure that it's actually aligned with the fund that you're looking to raise from. So I wonder, um, so you said, you know, you would, you take 100% uh, meetings if I introduced them and I, and I know you're not just saying that because we're sitting here together. This is the way this works, right? Uh, just like I would do the, the same with Kelsey. And um, I'm guessing, would it be the same if one of your portfolio founders introduced her to you? Oh yeah, yeah. That's almost that's like the best yeah. way. To, so, yeah. so you know, someone, uh, someone that has you know my credentials or Josh Bear, Brett Hurt, those that are active in the investment community, those that have had you know success with companies and whatnot. When Kelsey gives an introduction from us, she takes the meeting 100 percent of the time. It doesn't guarantee it has no guarantee of investment, but you're just trying to get the meeting to first, right? And then she just said a founder from one of her portfolio companies would get 100% at bats, right? So those are about, those are the two best you can get. So my first challenge to all of you is try and go get, go get that or as close as you can to that. If it's not me, I'm selective. I'm, I'm not just, I mean, we might have, we might have a great conversation over here in the, in the kitchen, uh, even drinking a glass of wine, but I, I'm not going to introduce you, right? It's, because because I know that Kelsey will take 100% of my meetings, that is a bridge that I cannot burn. If I waste her time, I'm gonna drop to a 90% at-bat uh, average with her, right? So we, we guard that very preciously. But, um, you know, if we get to know each other, and that's why working at a place like this, so I'm, I'm gonna ask Kelsey a question here in a second. Working at a place like Capital Factory, we have a bunch of mentors, uh, our startups find some of the best mentors for their type of business and you get to meet with them multiple times over time, right? And you start to develop a relationship. Maybe so much so that you ask them to join your board of advisors and you give them a little equity and they agree, right? And they attach to your company. If they're going to attach to your company, now they're probably willing to introduce you. So if one of our mentors introduces you and it's a mentor you don't know, can I assume it maybe is not 100% at bat? but it's gonna catch your attention. Yeah. Hey, I'm a Capital Factory mentor. We yeah. didn't have a chance to meet. I've been working with this founder. Her name is such and such. 
are you more likely than not to take that meeting? It depends on the company and like, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah. I've never met the person before. It's, yeah. I mean, I'll still love them. But introducing yeah. themselves as a capital, you know, I've been a capital. Yeah, that matters before. because someone else took the time to vet that person and get to know so them. So it's a, um, your, your next door neighbor is here and your sorority sister from college is here. Gordon, Josh, and Brett Hurd are here. Capital Factory mentors or managing directors of, of other programs that Kelsey doesn't know well but have a good reputation, they're in here. So you're trying to work your way up. And so I would recommend, I would challenge you that before you first just jump the gun and send the unsolicited email, see if you can't somehow get to one of those people. Kelsey mentions issues of bias and diversity and inclusion, and I think that is something that some of you will, will end up dealing uh, with for sure. And that's why she said she reads all of her emails and tries to tries to give a look. But I still uh, challenge you to try and find someone along that continuum to help get you in the door. Yeah. Anything else on that? Um. Just yeah. I think there's like, I think that's that covers it yep. decently well. But um, once you've like established the relationship, we've got an introductory meeting. The next part of the battle that I think a lot of folks kind of maybe don't do super well um, is really just like maintaining the line if there was interest but it wasn't a fit at the time. Mm -hmm. So like making sure that you, if you're sending out like stakeholder updates um, and you've identified that like myself, like I'm a great fit for you for your series A round, like you take the time to like add me to those updates and that's like just like a passive, but still like, engage, like way for you to engage and like build familiarity and like, you know, that relationship with that investor. Um, and doing that in like a way that scales, I think is a really good idea. We, you know, we have ADD and we have short memory spans as investors, and that's because we see a lot of deals. And I might have walked away from that first meeting pretty damn excited, and then two days later I meet with his company, and three days later I meet with her company. They were pretty exciting, and I've not totally forgotten about you. That's why this, this, this regular update is so important, and it shows us that you have a discipline. And when you send it out on the first yeah. Tuesday of every month at nine between nine o'clock and nine o eight, I'm exaggerating a little bit for effect. We understand that you have a discipline, and we also know that if we see that update five months in a row and then we don't get one for two months, we know bad shit happened. We know that, and so we also expect you to be honest with yourself and honest with us on those months and tell us about the pivot and tell us about what you learned because this is not, they shouldn't just be flowery up into the right graphs. That's not the way businesses work, right? So we want to see that you're being honest about the good, the bad, and the ugly, that you're a learning, uh, you're a learning organization, you're an adapting organization, and we get to see that in those monthly updates. Yeah. So then when it is the time, Kelsey's had, you've got, you don't have a dot, you have a nice line. And even if the line kind of went like this as it went there, it was here and then it's here. Yeah, really important. Most of you are, I'll bet every one of you a hundred dollars that you do not send a monthly update for, for a whole year. And that's because I'm going to make money out of seven out of 10 of you. I know I'm going to lose money on some of you, but I'll make money on seven out of 10. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. You pick what you want. So I'm a software engineer, 30 years, got started at IBM. My question is about time. So even though I'm a software engineer, I've typically been associated with multi multidisciplinary groups mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, classical engineers, all trying to make something together. And when you're making something complex like that, it takes a lot of time and it's a lot of capital. And it seems to me if I talk to investors, if I say it takes more than three years, that's it, game over. The, 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 it has to be sub two years to a product and content. And anything harder than that, well, it's not really worth your time. That's just my opinion. Yeah. I'd like your thoughts on this. Good one. I have some thoughts. I'll reflect to you first. So, uh, it is true in this day and age that there are many more, I'll just say, enterprise software category institutional investors. Why? Because they're, they can scale like crazy without significant amounts of money. And they found that's a sweet spot and there's a lot of them and there's a whole economy around that. It means those of you that are working on um, other types of businesses, those that require FDA certification, for example, those um, that involve hardware and you don't just there you don't just poof. there's more involved they, those businesses can be much more defensible right if I write if I write several thousand lines of code for some, some cool enterprise software my defensibility isn't near what your patentable hardware or or biotech startup has in it so there are some positive attributes but it means in the world of VCs 
you shrink quite a bit. And you'll just need to be more focused and find the VCs that invest in those kinds of deals. And there definitely are. They, there aren't very many in Texas, but there are some in Texas. And so yeah, you'll just need to get more hyper-focused in your criteria. You'll be wasting your time on a lot of the VCs. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm a hardware person and I'm, I'm not a B2B um, uh, software enterprise. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, a question to you is uh, how many startups in your portfolio is uh, not a software uh, company? And if you have a, a few, a question is, uh, as he was pointing out, uh, how do you evaluate those differently than software companies? So, what is our run rate? Yeah, so most of the companies in our portfolio aren't, um, like they're, they're a mix between software, uh, tech-enabled services, and then consumer products. Um, and I'm, I'm missing a couple, but like more or less that's kind of what, what it is. So we're you know not tied to, like we're not thesis-driven in the sense that we need to invest in certain markets or certain types of technologies, but there are, like, there are a couple things that will make a lot of like those deals and like, which are really in our sweet spot. Uh, at face value, like more attractive or easier to kind of assess than um, like a, a hardware or like life sciences or materials company or something like that. Um, so, I mean, when it comes to thinking about like the capex and like how much capital is going to be required to even you know start generating revenue, yeah, like that's a different way of thinking about the business, evaluating a business, and like building a business. And with us, um, like hands on as we are, and like the types of you know, companies that we're looking at to generate a return. Um, it has been that the portfolio has been strongly skewed towards um, more software related businesses. But we are like, you know, consumer product investors, so we're not just strictly like, focused on software. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would say, so about two thirds of my 28 year career in tech was in hardware companies. And um, when I think about it, we have quite a few hardware investments. Capital Factory does. We, we, don't, have any, we don't have any problems with uh, hardware, life sciences, biotech. We need a lead investor that also helps vet that. But um, you know, what I would say is first-time founders, hardware companies that are first-time founders and also somewhat young in their career. I mean, I'm saying they've got less than five or less than six years in hardware. They just don't have enough scars in their back um, the, the, you know, I have, a, I have a gray in my hair and a lot of scars in my back and a lot of those scars didn't come from just being able to make the hardware product work. It was over on the supply chain side or it was on the distribution side. So getting the product to market and the service and the serviceability, the supportability of it, the basics of building something that will work and having a bill of materials that is manageable. I don't want to say that's easy. But in terms of growing a great company that's going to get to an exit, that's one of the more easier parts of it. And what I like to see, I like to see some people in there that um, you know, have held a soldering iron in their hand for many years. And I want to see a gray-haired supply chain executive that has royally screwed up a lot of things with going through China and then not through China and, you know, and understands all of the certifications and the testing. and you know, you all that are in this know that every iteration, I mean, holy crap, when the mold has to be redone, you hit, you, you're you not, you know, you're not like a software company where you just take a day or two to fix a bug, you hit the reset button and now you've got another couple or, you know, maybe a few months. Every single iteration, when they didn't understand what you were trying to tell them to move this thing here and shave one eighth of one millimeter off of this thing and then they did the wrong thing and it took a month and a half to figure that out. So you guys understand the cycle time. Time kills companies and so it just makes it harder but it makes it more defensible. So that hardware companies that have their shit together and know what they're doing, I think they can really impress investors. But so, those are some thoughts. Thanks. Yeah. You take it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, 
<laughs> we got time for one or two more questions, and then we're going to spill into the into the break room where we have some food and some food and some beer and wine. This is a pretty quick one. Um, what is uh, the biggest mistake you see first time entrepreneurs making uh, raising raising money? Kind of negative before uh, and going to the bus for the first time. Uh, maybe it's just a quick answer. If there's if it's too hard to to narrow it down to one. <coughs> I'll give like one or two. Yeah. Nothing world changing, but maybe it'll be helpful. Yeah. Um, one is, you know, in the process of pitching, just we see a lot of just like poor communication. So lack of being able to effectively communicate what you do, overuse of like industry specific jargon. Um, you know, if you have 10 seconds, like to get what you're doing across and like generate interest from someone, right? Um, I mean, make an effective use of that time and like make sure that what you're saying is clear. So I think that's one thing. Um, two is not is not budgeting enough time in the fundraising process. These are not like the largest mistakes you can make, but these are just like very common things I see done. Uh, and I'm sure you know you you do as well. Um, thinking that it'll take you you know like one month or two months or whatever to start and finish a fundraise, a formal fundraising process for like a million plus whatever round, um, I think is not, I think that's not enough time. And I think, you know, three to six month is period is probably a lot, makes a lot more sense for a first time um, early stage founder. So okay. those are two things. Okay. Definitely good ones. Maybe one that I would add is presenting the company, not just the product. Early founders are so maniacally focused on and in love with the product, they think that the investors are investing in the product. And, you know, you have to build a company around that product because it's the company that's going to, you know, grow into something that's exitable. And when it does that, the product isn't important, but just one of a bunch of important things. So not just like when you show up and all you want to do is, you know, show me the demo and talk about this feature and tell me about like, yeah, yeah tell me about the company. I want to know about the company. Yeah. All right, one more and then we'll, we'll take a break. Well, you pick. All right, go ahead in the back. Uh, uh, sure. yes. okay. uh, so, segue into a lot of these. Um, <coughs> you're selling your company, we can go pitch investors. So, it's a sales prospect. How do you build that pipeline? How do you go, and, and particularly if you are like a hard bread bag or you know that you've got like a narrower specific type of investor you're looking for, how do you find any good resources? to build them who I want to go yeah. get the connection to. Yeah, there are lists of investors. You, you know, you don't even have to subscribe to them. I think uh, David Altunian and somebody. Stephen Strauss. And Stephen Strauss did a, they have a blog post that at the time it cataloged all of the investors in Austin or Texas, was it? Um, I think it was Texas, but Texas? I know that. I mean, even the list that you have uh, The here. list we have here. Yeah. And, and then also, Countries, you know, articles. subscribe to Austin Business Journal and Austin Inno and Texas Squared. The reason to do so is just at a quick skim, you'll be able to see if there's any headlines for a company kind of like yours, you're selling or you know focused on your industry or your category of product, and you just want to see that. If you see somebody raised a seed round, somebody raised a Series A, who was it? Add that to your list. Oh, just saw that so and so invested in a hardware startup. Saw that so and so invested in a life sciences. Companies. I guess I should have narrowed that down a little bit. Yep. So pre-seed, seed, pre-seed and seed. Uh, pre-seed is how to find the angels. Pre-seed, it's all it's networking, networking, networking. Because yeah, pre-seed you know, angels don't hang out a shingle. Angels don't have websites. Angels don't have business cards. You know, Kelsey was able. Every VC and every person in a venture fund can rattle off their investment thesis with the way she introduced her company. They do it two times every day. Um, angels aren't that way. And so, hmm, near impossible. There is there is an online there's an online service you know uh, yeah. uh, called uh, Angel List. Right. It's it's not as active anymore, but still I would if you don't have another one you know you're on Angel List you're trying to, to trying to there, find investors. There are lists like random like ad hoc lists that people will put out that just like work in the tech and like VC world. Yeah. Um, so you just got to do some digging online for for that kind of thing. Otherwise, I feel like. The more you can like network and like tap into your own, yeah. you know, um, relationship base, like the better when it comes. Who are to the people. mentors at Capital Factory? Who are the mentors yeah. at TechStars? Who are the mentors at Mass Challenge? Mentors have been there and done that. Doesn't mean they're all investors, but those that are not investors 
are connected in with a lot of early stage investors. So if you go to the Capital Factory slash mentors page, you can search by industry and other criteria. Um, you might not have the search criteria that you're looking for, but hey, there's 130 profiles on there. If you look at if you look at 20 of them every week, you can get through it in a couple months, you know. Um, and then do the same thing for tech stars, same thing for Mass Challenge and yeah. others. And I constantly am, you know, telling folks who are looking to raise angel funding um, in Austin. Like, I mean, just literally coming here and just figuring out the mentor yeah. network here is the easiest way to meet like the highest volume of angel investors at one given point in time with the least like barrier to entry. And I say that because a lot of the angel groups can make it difficult to, to yeah. you know go through their process and actually like, meet the members who are investing. Um, and I feel like it's a lot more straightforward. Yep. Capital and other founders, other founders running businesses like yours, whatever like yours means, is there a meetup group that's in, that has an affinity with what you're doing? Go to the meetup group. What do those founders say of active yep. angels? And yeah, it's it's a lot of networking. It's extremely hard. I mean, it's hard, hard, hard. Yep. You know? But getting through that, I mean, that's val it's validating getting through that, raising some money, accomplishing things. I mean. The next phase of investors, they, they understand it wasn't difficult. You know, it's a, it's a, it's the ninja American Ninja Challenge kind of thing. And you get to the end and hit the thing, and those get to go on to the, to the next round. All right, let's spill into the to the kitchen. Um, actually, two things. Um, give Kelsey a shout out on social media. She's uh, at K E L S K M N, right? K E L L S K A M I N. Give her a shout out. Give Silverton a shout out if you don't mind on social media. Uh, Jill, if you'll raise your hand real quick. Jill in the back corner, she's a venture associate for the Capital Factory Accelerator. If uh, any of you have shipping products and paying customers and you think are accelerators of interest, she'll be in the she'll be in the kitchen and I'm going straight there to, to grab a beer. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you. Shockwaveinnovations.com. Shockwaveinnovations.com. Uh, plural, with the S of Shockwave Innovations. Yeah, it's in July. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Oh, you're going to come back?